to those who are joining us online. I'm Jose Luis de Aro with the Communications uh, Department here at the International Monetary Fund. And we're gathered here today for the launch of the World Economic Outlook, also known as WIO Update. I hope uh, that by this time you all had uh, access to a copy of the document. If not, I would encourage you to go to our website, imf.org. There you will find the WIO update, the blog authored by Pierre Olivier, and many other assets, such as some of the data underlying our charts and tables. As you can see, joining us here today are Pierre Olivier Gugincha. He's the economic counselor and the director of the research department. Next to him are Petia Kova Brooks, deputy director at the research department and Daniel Lee, division chief, also at the research department. Uh, before we start, I would like to make uh, two quick points for those who are unfamiliar with the World Economic Outlook cycle. We published two updates throughout the year, one in January and another one in July. These updates only include a limited number of uh, countries to which we offer a revised outlook. That said, we include a full outlook for the global economy, uh, the risk uh, to our baseline, and of course, our policy recommendations. And it is only during our spring meetings in April and annual meetings in October that we published a full edition of the World Economic Outlook, including a full data set and analytical chapters. Uh, P. Olivier, Petit, and Daniel are here to discuss the World Economic Outlook and its uh, content in detail. That said, if you have uh, any uh, specific questions on country programs, staff level agreements, negotiations, or questions of this nature, I would encourage you to reach out to us bilaterally to media at imf.org so we can point you in the right direction on how to answer these questions. I think I talked enough, and let me stop here and pass the floor to Pierre Olivier. Well, thank you, Jose, and welcome, everyone. I'm going to offer a few brief remarks uh, before we get to the Q&A. Uh, the global economy continues to gradually recover from the pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but it is not yet out of the woods. The COVID-19 health crisis is officially over. Supply chain disruptions have returned to pre-pandemic levels. Economic activity in the first quarter of the year proved resilient, and labor markets are quite tight in many places. Energy and food prices have come down faster than expected from their war-induced peaks. And financial instability following the March banking turmoil remains contained thanks to forceful actions by the US and Swiss authorities. Under our baseline forecast, growth will slow down slightly less than projected from 3.5% last year to 3% this year, a 0.2 percentage point upward revision for 2023. The slowdown is especially concentrated in advanced economies where growth will fall from 2.7% last year to 1.5% this year. By contrast, growth in emerging markets and developing economies will remain stable at 4% this year and 4.1% next year. Now, this masks significant differences between countries and regions, with emerging and developing Asia growing strongly at 5.3% this year, while many commodity producers will suffer from a decline in export revenues. At the same time, global inflation is projected to decline slightly faster than projected in April, from 8.7% last year to 6.8% this year, a 0.2 percentage point downward revision. Now, stronger growth and lower inflation than expected are welcome news, suggesting the global economy is headed in the right direction. Yet growth remains low by historical standards, and while some adverse risks have moderated, the balance remains tilted to the downside, and it is too early to celebrate. There are growing signs that global activity is losing momentum. The global tightening of monetary policy has brought interest rates into contractionary territory. This has started to weigh down on activity, slowing the growth of credit to the non-financial sector, increasing households' and firms' interest payments, and putting pressure on real estate markets. In the US, excess savings from the pandemic-related transfers, which helped households weather the cost of living crisis, are all but depleted. In China, the recovery following the reopening of its economy shows signs of losing steam, while there are continued concerns about the property sector. Second, core inflation, which excludes energy and food prices, remains well above central bank targets and is expected to decline only gradually. In advanced economies, core inflation is expected to remain unchanged at 5.1% this year, before declining to 3.1% in 2024. Clearly, the battle against inflation is not yet won. 
Key to inflation's persistence will be labor market developments and wage profit dynamics. Despite tight labor markets, overall wage inflation has increased, but remains behind price inflation in most countries. The reason is simple and has little to do with so-called greedflation. Prices adjust upwards faster than wages when nominal demand far exceeds what the economy can produce. As a result, real wages have declined. If labor markets remain strong, we should expect and welcome real wages recovering lost ground. Indeed, the gap between nominal wage growth and price inflation has started to close. <clears throat> because firms' profit margins have grown robustly in the last two years, we remain confident that there is room to accommodate the rebound in real wages without triggering a wage price spiral. With inflation expectations well anchored in major economies and the economy slowing, market pressures should help contain the pass-through from labor costs to prices. Now, despite monetary policy tightening and the slowdown in bank lending, financial conditions have eased since the banking stress in March. Equity market valuations surged and the dollar depreciated further, driven by market expectations of a more benign path for U.S. interest rates and stronger risk appetite. This provided some relief to emerging and developing countries. Going forward, there is a danger of a sharp repricing should inflation surprise to the upside or global risk appetite deteriorate with higher borrowing costs and increased debt distress. Hopefully, with inflation starting to recede, we have entered the final stage of the inflationary cycle that started in 2021. But hope is not a policy, and the touch done may prove quite difficult to execute. Risks to inflation are now more balanced, and most major economies are less likely to need additional outsized increases in policy rates. Yet, it remains critical to avoid easing monetary policy until underlying inflation shows clear signs of sustained cooling. And we are not there yet. All the while, central banks should continue to monitor the financial system and stand ready to use their other tools to maintain financial stability. Now, after years of heavy fiscal support and rising interest rates, debt service is now increasing as a share of government revenues for both advanced and emerging markets. It is now time to gradually restore fiscal buffers and put debt dynamics on a more sustainable footing. This will help safeguard financial stability and will reinforce the overall credibility of the disinflation strategy. This is not a call for generalized austerity. The pace and composition of fiscal consolidation should be mindful of the strength of private demand while protecting the most vulnerable. Yet some consolidation measures seem entirely appropriate. For instance, where energy prices are back to their pre-pandemic levels, fiscal measures such as energy subsidies should be phased out. Now, fiscal space is also key to implement many needed structural reforms. This is especially important since prospects for medium-term growth in income per capita have dimmed over the past decade. The slowdown is sharper for low- and middle-income economies relative to high-income ones. In other words, prospects for catching up to higher living standards have diminished markedly. At the same time, elevated debt levels are preventing many low-income and frontier economies from making the investments they need to grow faster with high risks of debt distress in many places. Now, some of the slowdown in growth reflects the spillover of harmful policies. The rise of geoeconomic fragmentation with the global economy potentially splitting into rival blocks will most harm emerging and developing economies that are more reliant on integrated global economy, direct investment, and technology transfers. Insufficient progress on the climate transition will also leave poorer countries more exposed to increasingly severe climate shocks and rising temperatures, even as they account for a small fraction of global emissions. On all of these issues, multilateral cooperation remains the best way to ensure a safe and prosperous economy for all. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre-Olivier. And before we open the floor to your questions, I want to remind some uh, ground rules. If you want to ask a, a question uh, here in the room or on, via WebEx, please uh, raise your hand. Wait till I call you. If I do, please identify yourself, the outlet that you represent. Also, I want to remind the people in the room to turn on your mic so everybody can hear your, your question. I will try to balance things between people in the room, WebEx and the press center, so uh, everybody gets uh, uh, to ask a, a question. We have a limited time, so I ask you to be concise. Um, we can start. Uh, let's start here in the room with Andrea Shalal. 
Reuters. Hi, thank you, Andrea Shalal with Reuters. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, um, Pierre Olivier, I want to ask you about the, the growing signs that momentum is slowing. Can you say a few words about the medium term outlook and where you see the trajectory of growth growing in, few, in the coming years and what the biggest uh, challenges are from your point of view, but also how that could be changed. Like how could that momentum, how could that be momentum be re revitalized? Yes, I can say a few words about that, Andrea. Thank you for the question. It's uh, really an important one. There are two components to the slowdown that we're seeing. There is a near-term slowdown that we're seeing, the slowdown in growth to 3% this year and also 3% next year. And some of this is on the back of tightening monetary policy that is designed to cool off uh, the aggregate economy and bring back inflation towards uh, central bank targets. But if we extend the horizon and look further than that to the four or five years out, and we have these projections in our world economic outlook, we also see that those gross numbers remaining fairly low. We have a, a five-year out growth that is around also about 3%. That is more worrisome because it's suggesting that there is slowdown in underlying productivity growth, which is really the key engine for improvements in standards of living. And it's also, we need more growth in order to be able to finance some of the biggest challenges we're facing. Now, what are some of the reasons for this? Well, to be fair, this is a question that a lot of people are thinking about, and we don't yet have the answer. We are actively working on this, but we can already think about uh, some drivers. Some of it is related probably to the aging population and slowdown in population growth. Some of it is also related probably to the slowdown in the convergence of lower income economies or emerging market economies to the frontier. And some of it could be also related to the impact of the pandemic, the scarring that we had during the pandemic, years of schooling lost, lost investment, governments that have invested heavily to protect their economies, but now don't have necessarily the fiscal resources to engage the next round of structural reforms. All of these factors are sort of weighing together. On top of that, you have also the risk that I've mentioned in my opening remarks of fragment, increasing fragmentation that would dislocate further the global economy and would weigh down on growth for emerging and developing economies. I'm wondering what could kickstart, what could give fresh impetus to that momentum? Like what could, what could happen? Like if fragmentation is reversed or, you know, what... Well, a number of structural reforms would certainly help. We, we mentioned a few in our, in our update. For instance, reforms that would increase labor force participation, that would reduce the duality in labor markets in many countries, or increase women's labor force participation, increase in schooling, increase in human capital. All of these things would certainly go in the right direction. Certain types of reform that would spur investment, especially if we think about, for instance, what is needed on the green transition, the fact that you have to invest in the, in the green sectors of the economy, that could also, also be an engine of growth going, uh, going forward. So we are exploring, as I said, we're exploring some of these questions now. We don't have a definite answer, but clearly uh, de defining the space and opening the space for structural reforms that would unleash some, uh, some uh, potential growth will be, will be key here. Okay, I'm going to take another question in the room and then I will go to the press center. I'm going to go here in the first room, Kovi, in the first uh, row, then I will go back to the people behind. Thank you so much, Colby Smith with the Financial Times. I'm curious how much of the moderation in headline and core inflation you attribute to the action central banks have taken over the last um, year and a half or so, um, or if it's simply just a reflection of a reversal of some of the temporary uh, price pressures stemming from the war in Ukraine and uh, and the pandemic. Um, and, and what does that then suggest about the path forward getting from core inflation at these current levels back down to 2% and the, and the costs associated with that? Okay, Olivier. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions uh, kind of related here in the press center. One comes from the Telegraph. Uh, it says, uh, you talk about dangers of inflation remaining stubbornly high. Uh, will the collapse of the recent Black Sea grain deal and India's rice export ban usher in another wave of inflation delay expected fails, falls? And then we have another question from Greg uh, Queen, Market News Service International. Investors have spent most of the year betting that the Fed and other central banks will cut interest rates. Why do you say rates can only fall next year? All right, so that's a lot of questions. Let me address them in, in turn. When we think about, so we have this decline in headline inflation, and a lot of that is coming from the decline in energy prices and food prices. So some of this is, in a sense, 
related to the slowdown in global activity. So that's indirectly related to the tightening of monetary policy that is bringing down growth to 3%. And we know that demand for energy and for uh, commodities is related to global level of activity. So indirectly, some of the decline in energy prices is coming from the action of monetary policy. But at this stage, I would say one of the big achievements of monetary policy in tightening rates has been not so much in bringing at, you know, energy prices down. They've been coming down not just because of monetary policy, but because the energy crisis is behind us to some extent. But it's been very important in keeping inflation expectation anchored. And so the counterfactual that I like to have in the back of my mind is if monetary policy had not been tightening the way it has been tightening in the last year, we would probably have a private sector that would be saying, well, no one is doing anything about inflation, so why should we expect inflation to be coming down? And we'd be looking at a very different environment. So monetary policy has been very helpful in containing inflation expectations. Then going forward, what we're seeing is monetary policy is already taking a, a chunk out of economic activity. We're seeing the increase in interest payments. We're seeing the contraction in lending. We're seeing signs that the economy is cooling off, and that's going to help bring down the sort of underlying inflation pressures back to central bank targets. So it's already had some effect and will continue to have some effect. Now, on the questions that came from uh, from Webex on the Black Sea Grain Initiative, I mean, it's very clear that the uh, Black Sea Grain Initiative uh, was very instrumental in making sure that there would be ample uh, grain supply uh, to the world in the last year. And there are estimates of about 33 million tons of grain that were shipped from, uh, from Ukraine to the rest of the world. And that helped keep uh, price pressures on uh, uh, food uh, and grain prices uh, uh, lower. Now, the same, now that this grain deal has been suspended, the same mechanics works in reverse, and it's likely to put upward pressure on food prices. Um, and we have some estimates that we're uh, looking at, you know, in terms of how much of the supply is gonna be withdrawn and what is the elasticity of, uh, of prices to the reduction in demand. And we're still assessing where we're gonna land, but we would be thinking that somewhere in the range of 10, 15% increase in prices of grains is a reasonable estimate, although, we'll have to see exactly how this is going to uh, to unfold. Now, in terms of the Federal Reserve and why we're saying that monetary policy needs to remain tight, uh, uh, even if it doesn't mean increasing very much compared to uh, where it is, uh, the reason is very simple. It's related to the underlying inflation pressures. We have core inflation in the US, for instance, the core inflation is expected at 4.9% for uh, 2023. Uh, that's still uh, uh, two and a half times above the central bank target. So there's a need for monetary policy to remain in contractionary territory, especially given the strength of the economy and the strength of the uh, uh, underlying demand. I think I see where from GK News on WebEx, where if you hear me, you can unmute and ask your question. Yes, um, thank you, Jose. A uh, question on China. China's leader pledged to step up policy support for the economy, demanded efforts to actively expand domestic demand, and the government also unveiled more measures to revive a uh, private economy. So we'd like to hear your thoughts on the uh, stimulus program and any uh, policy recommendations. Thank you. Well, thank you. So China uh, has been rebounding strongly uh, after the reopening of the economy in uh, uh, the end of last year. And uh, the first quarter was, was very strong, but it's true that we've seen some weakening of economic activity in the second quarter. And uh, uh, the, the growth numbers that we have reflect that, uh, that expected uh, weakening going forward. A weakening that has two components, really. One is uh, related to the uh, uh, the, the still the problems in the real estate sector, in the, in the, in the property sector, uh, that is weighing down on, uh, on consumer confidence, but also a, a relatively low growth uh, uh, in the global economy with 3% growth, that means also less demand for uh, Chinese goods, so the external side is, is also a little bit on the weak side. Now, on the measures that uh, uh, the Chinese government could take, let me turn it over to, uh, to my colleague, Danielle, uh, who can provide some, uh, some additional elements. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we see the the measures that the authorities have taken to strengthen confidence in the real estate sector and their extension to 2025 as a as a positive step and uh, to further uh strengthen the the growth momentum more could be done uh in particular to make sure that those pre-sold properties are are delivered and uh, that there is targeted support to families and that could really uh, raise confidence strengthen consumption uh, with positive implications also for the region. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's go second row 
uh, Rafa Matus, La Nación. Thanks, Jose. Thank you for this uh, press conference. Uh, I understand that the latest numbers of the IMF regarding Argentina point to a recession this year. I was hoping if you could share the latest projections for the country and also Pierre Rivier. We are in an election year. Uh, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about how should the next government address the current challenges facing the economy. Thanks. Before you answer, Pio Olivier, we have plenty of questions on Argentina, and I see Liliana Franco on WebEx. So please, Liliana, come in. Good morning. Good morning. I have a question related. Uh, yesterday, the economy minister, Sergio Massa, said that this Thursday would be released the tough level agreement to the public. I would like to know if that correct. And uh, furthermore, when the board will meet to analyze the uh, Argentine program. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. I think that these kind of questions uh, should be treated bilaterally and definitely we will get you we will try to get you an answer on those but uh, regarding the outlook for argentina we have also another question in the press center from martin canningsinger um, from infobae uh, i would like to know your growth and inflation projections for argentina for 2023 and 2024 if you are concerned about the country having one of the highest inflation rates in the world and how it should be lowered thank you well, thank you. So first, I mean, uh, I should start by acknowledging that Argentina is facing a very difficult situation, particularly that's made, it's made worse by the, the drought, the, the, the agricultural drought it has been facing in the last uh, in the last year or so. Uh, on the uh, updated numbers, let me turn it over to uh, Petya Cueva Books, who can provide some uh, some details. Sure. So for for this year, indeed, we have revised our growth uh, numbers to uh, minus three, and and that was a downward, uh, a fairly significant downward revision, and pretty much the reason for that was the one that Pierre Olivier already mentioned. It was the drought, and the agricultural production and its revival is also what's behind. The, uh, the projected rebound of growth in 2024 to uh, 3%. Now, um, when it comes to inflation, we are, we are projecting inflation to be at 120 uh, at the end of the year. And, um, and, and that is predicated on implementing the macroeconomic policies uh, that have been um, agreed upon. Um, so this, again, this requires some moderation in the uh, inflation rates in order to, to reach this uh, 120 and again predicated on, on tight uh, macroeconomic policies. Let, let me stop here. Okay, so I have a, before we move to regions, I want to stay in Latin America. There's a question about uh, the outlook uh, behind uh, uh, um, Latin America and the Caribbean. And then we have also a specific question on Brazil. It comes from Agencia Estado. Um, Brazil received the best uh, revision from IMF uh, for the GDP's growth this year between the countries. The first uh, quarter was pushed by agricult agricultural or agriculture, but uh, the next won't be so, so good. After concluding the mission the, in the country, IMF recommended to Brazil major fiscal rigor. Uh, what's uh, behind Brazil's outlook? So Latin American outlook and then Brazil outlook. All right, let me let me say a few words and I'll turn it over to Daniel. Uh, uh, so on Latin America, there's been, uh, in general, for the region, there's been uh, a, a re resilience. Uh, um, there's been some resilience, in, but slowing resilience in, in sort of domestic demand. So this is why we're seeing some of the, some of this slowdown. This is uh, a, a region that has also, uh, in many countries, have tightened their uh, policy rates starting earlier than many advanced economies and, and sometimes increasing rates much more than, uh, than, than other countries. And that's also weighing down uh, on economic activity. Uh, and, and then some of the countries are also uh, uh, suffering from the decline in, uh, in some of the commodity prices that are weighing down on, the, on, the, on their export sector. But Daniel. Of the third patio. Oh, no, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, so when it comes to Brazil, uh, we did see fairly strong growth last year at about 2.9. So this year we do have a bit of a slowdown, 
to 2.1, but as the question uh, implied, this was already a fairly significant upward revision. Um, the upward revision was 1.2, which is indeed one of the larger ones that, that we'd seen this time around. The reason for the upward revision was very much the, uh, the bumper crops and the agricultural production, which surprised very much on the upside uh, in the first quarter. Uh, and th this was in spite of uh, manufacturing and services uh, being fairly sub subdued during the first, uh, uh, during that period. So looking into 24, we're expecting growth to slow down to 1.2. Um, at the same time, uh, Brazil is one of the countries that uh, hiked rates um, among the first. Inflation is coming down. Headline inflation has turned. A core is more sticky, uh, but at the same time, we are expecting it to, uh, to, to converge gradually to the target. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go Lalit. Thank you for doing this. I wanted to ask you about India's, there has been slight upward revision in the India's projections. Can you give us some reasons for that and also what impact uh, the global inflation will have on India's decision to restrict export of certain categories of rice last week? Before, before we continue uh, with questions about India, I just want to make a clarification on Argentina. Uh, the growth number for 20. Twenty-three. It's minus two point five. More questions on um, India on uh, the press center. Uh, that goes as follows: What uh, more can be done to push growth in emerging markets and developing economies, especially India? And then, what is your expectation of inflation in India? And do you expect central bank to cut rates in twenty twenty four? So let, let me uh, uh, offer a few remarks on, on India, and, and this time I will turn to Daniel. Um, the, so we have a, a slight uh, upward revision for growth in 2023, about 0 0.2 percentage point. India remains uh, an economy that is growing quite strongly. Uh, I mean, it's coming down from really a very strong year in 2022 at 7.2%. That was also revised upwards, by the way. Um, but still slow down, but still fairly strong fairly strong growth and fairly strong uh, momentum. Uh, Daniel will, will provide some additional details. Let me just say one word on the, on, the, on the food export restrictions, because I think that's an important point. And it goes back also to the conversation we we're having earlier on the Black Sea Grain deal. In the current environment, uh, these types of restrictions are likely to exacerbate uh, volatility on uh, on food prices in the rest of the world, uh, and they can also lead to retaliatory measures. So they are certainly something that we uh, we would encourage uh, um, the removal of uh, of uh, these these type of export restrictions because they can be they can be harmful uh, globally. Thank you. So uh, India is a country with uh, growth uh, very strong and continuing to be strong. It's it's about one sixth of total global growth is accounted for by India right uh, this year, and inflation is back inside the the target range in our in our estimates. Uh, for 2023, we have a forecast of 6.1% growth for India. Um, that's well above the regional average uh, of 5.3. It's moderating after a very strong uh, 2022. Um, but uh, we have an upside revision of 0.2 percentage points for 2023. And that's really the knock-on effect of a very uh, strong ending for 2024 20, with government and, and private investment. Uh, now, uh, for the inflation forecast, we, we have 4.9% for this year, and that's well inside the uh, two to six uh, target band. Uh, food prices easing is what has contributed to that, but also uh, the strong uh, t actions by the uh, Reserve Bank of India, uh, which uh, raised rates, and we see this, uh, you know, the need to continue uh, to balance uh, the pressures and, uh, for inflation and, and an output to, to make sure that inflation stays inside that target range as we expect it will. Okay, we're going to go back to, let's uh, go here. Barry Wood, RTHK in Hong Kong. You mentioned the risk of splitting into rival blocks. Could you say more about that, its characteristics, 
its implications for the world economy and looking ahead in terms of G20 policy coordination, how does that potentially impact that? Should I answer? Yeah. Have, yep, okay. Um, so uh, this uh, geoeconomic fragmentation risk is something that we have uh, spent quite a bit of time uh, uh, thinking about and doing a, a fair amount of analytical work at the fund in general, in the research department in particular, there are a number of channels that we uh, we think are particularly relevant. So there is a there is a trade channel, and we see the increase in uh, in trade restrictions that have been imposed by countries on one another. Uh, that started before the last year and a half, but it's as accelerated, and it's likely to uh, uh, lead to. Um, uh, you know, have some negative impact on, on on trade flows, and you can think about either some type of export restrictions or or, or tariffs or or other measures that are that are implemented. There is an impact in terms of direct investment also that is quite important, and that's something that we've studied in at length in in one of the analytical chapters of our last report in April. And there, one of the key takeaways is we already see direct investment increasingly being determined by geopolitical proximity between countries rather than geographical proximity. So you're likely to invest more in countries that are geopolitically close rather than uh, just nearby. Um, and then third, and that's something that we are also exploring, and that gets to the point you were raising about coordination and, and the G20, uh, there is an impact through uh, commodity prices uh, because uh, uh, the, the distribution of natural resources is not, is not uniform. Uh, some countries are endowed with natural resources, some countries are not. And, and of course, for the global economy to function, then these natural resources, these commodities need to, need to be traded, need to be flowing. This is especially relevant when we think beyond just energy, but when we think about the climate transition. The, the need for critical minerals is going to be a, a, is going to be a first order need in order to produce the batteries, the the, uh, the solar panels, etc. That we need for uh, electrifying and greening our our, our 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 energy production, and that raises the question of whether we're going to be able to do that if the economy. Uh, become separated into blocks that are not trading this kind of critical components. So that's an area where, of course, coordination, collaboration uh, is absolutely needed, and the G20 and the other fora and you know, places like the IMF have a role to play. Thank you, Pierre Libier. I have a couple of questions uh, regarding Spain on the press center. Uh, they go as follows. Uh, why are you improving the projection for the Spanish economy? And what is your forecast for Spanish inflation? Also questions uh, regarding the elections on Sunday. Does this uncertainty going to affect the outlook for uh, Spain? Is there any question in the room for uh, Spain? No. Nope. So go ahead, please. Well, so the, let me start from maybe from the euro area and, 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 and get to Spain because I think we'll... Uh, so what we have for the, for the euro area is overall we have uh, uh, the projections are largely unchanged uh, uh, from our previous round. Uh, so, you know, we, we have growth uh, uh, slowing down quite sharply from last year, 3.5% to 0.9%. Uh, to but this uh, sort of lack of change hides a lot of differences across different countries. And what we see when we unpack this is you have countries like Germany, for instance, that are slowing down uh, uh, quite a bit. From, from last year and even are in, uh, in negative growth territory according to our projections for, for the year, mildly so. And then you have countries that are, that are doing better and Spain is among the countries that is, uh, that is doing better with both in the case of Spain, something that is quite uh, important to note because it's not so common, is both an improvement in terms of the growth projections that are uh, for this year projected at 2.5%. So that's a one percentage point upward revision. It's quite strong. And part of this is, is related to the strength of tourism. And that's a general theme that we see in, the, in, our, in our report is we've had this rotation of global demand. Initially, as the economies reopened, there was a strong demand for goods. But people were not traveling, people were not going out necessarily as much, so services remained depressed. And then in the second phase, we had an increase in services. So people started traveling again, going out, and then the demand for goods sort of tapered off. And so this demand for services is having a strong impact on countries that are 
uh, a destination for, for tourism. We see that for Spain, we see that for Italy at the same time. The second notable thing about Spain is that, in fact, it's doing well on growth, but it's also doing well on inflation. We've had the, a downward revision for its inflation numbers, or is also quite sizable. Uh, headline inflation is expected to be only 3.2% uh, this year. Uh, which is well, well below uh, the average inflation in other European uh, uh, economies. Okay, we, we are running out of time. I'm going to try to get one question here in the room, and then I have uh, two questions on the presenter. Shu. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jose. Thank you very much for taking all my questions. And uh, my question is on Japan, China, and you, according to the report, you revised up uh, Japanese economy by 0.1%. Point one percent, uh, quite uh, slightly uh, this year because of pent up demand and uh, expansive policy. And but I'm wondering, uh, could these factors be a uh, lasting or sustainable driver? And the second question is on China and not only Japan but also China now seems to be uh, quite facing uh, deflationary pressures. And what is your view on such development in? Eastern Asian countries, uh, big economies, especially compared with uh, the rest of the world, or major uh, US or uh, European countries. Thank you. So on, on uh, uh, Japan first. Uh, so in Japan, we've had, uh, as, as you point out, a mild upward revision in, in 2023. The Japanese economy is, is actually one of the few advanced economies that is doing better in 2023. Then in 2022, we're expecting 1.4 percent growth in, uh, in in 2023 uh, for Japan, and then and expected to moderate. The the risk in the Japanese economy, and I think you alluded to that, is is we're seeing inflation pressures increasing. There is there is upside risk to inflation. Inflation, of course, in the case of Japan, we're starting from a situation where inflation has been too low for very very long, uh, uh, not hitting the the two percent target and well below it, and now we're in a situation where inflation is above. The inflation target and the question is whether it will remain there or whether it will be coming back down towards the inflation target on its own and uh, uh, right now the risk is probably on the upside that maybe inflation pressures will continue to remain uh, above above the the target we had a fairly strong uh, wage negotiation round in the spring in in japan uh, and so our advice for uh, uh, for J uh, the Japanese authorities there is is that right now the monetary policy can remain accommodating, but it needs to prepare itself for the need to maybe uh, uh, start tightening. And for that, uh, our recommendation is to be a bit more flexible and maybe move away from the the yield curve control uh, 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 that it has. Uh, now on China, maybe uh, let me let me turn it back to uh, to Daniel. Thank you. A uh, question about China's inflation uh, is uh, uh, relates to the fact that we revised down uh, Chinese inflation by almost 0 0.9 percentage points to 1.1 percent for 2023. This is one of the uh, only countries in the world right now where inflation is below the uh, target rate. Uh, this also, uh, given uh, uh, China's large size, means that global inflation is actually revised down for this year. So it's such a large uh, revision. And what is behind this is uh, really subdued core inflation. Uh, there is a significant slack in the Chinese economy. You know, consumption is still below the pre-pandemic trend. Unemployment has gone up, particularly for youth uh, unemployment, above 20 percent. Uh, so uh, in this context, um, also of falling energy prices, uh, which has further spread to, to lower inflation throughout the economy, we've, we've got uh, pretty low inflation this year. We think this will uh, increase next year to about 1.9% in China uh, as these uh, effects uh, fade. Uh, but it, uh, it's appropriate the central bank, um, you know, eased monetary policy and uh, to make sure that inflation does uh, come back towards the target level. Okay, let's go for one more here and then we will go to the press center. I ask you to be brief because I'm trying to squeeze all the regions and we need to finish in the next uh, five, ten minutes. Thank you. Uh, just one follow up on Germany because I was wondering what is the largest factor for Germany's slowdown? Is it what short term stimulus measures short term you think would make sense at this point? Thank you. Yes. 
Pitya, would you like to take Germany? <laughs> sure. We have downgraded the forecast for Germany for uh, for this year to negative 0.3 um, from, um, from earlier in April. Now, we're also talking about, we're having, you know, this path where the economy was growing relatively well last year, 1.8, might minus 0.3 this year. And so the question is, what's behind this? Well, a big part of the slowdown is related to the um, negative impact that inflation is having on real incomes. So real income is less. And of course, there is the monetary tightening, which is happening at the euro area level, which is very much needed in order to tackle inflation. So financing conditions are tighter. So, so that's uh, in, a, in a nutshell the, the, the story behind the slowdown. We are expecting the, uh, the second quarter to be somewhat stronger and for, for this relatively sluggish growth rates to, to, to continue for the rest of the year. Um, now, all of that being said, looking forward to 2020, 24, we are expecting a growth to recover to 1.3. And on the measures, sorry. On the measures, we uh, we actually think that um, you know the uh, they had been me measures provided in terms of uh, to, uh, to to help households to help with with the energy um, uh, crisis which occurred. More generally, we think that these measures. Uh, now that the energy prices are back to uh, to to more normal levels, these measures should be allowed to um, uh, to kind of to uh, to to be retired um, over time. Uh, and I think you know, at ultimately, um, you know, when we look at the fiscal situation, uh, we 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 do think that the broader level that it's important to restore buffers and to look ahead in that. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, two last questions and I'm gonna try to bundle because they are from regions that we haven't touched. Uh, we go to the middle, middle East. Uh, there we have uh, Doha Abdel Monem from Al Aharam. Uh, what are the IMF's projections for Egypt's growth, inflation and debt under the new WIO report? Then we have a similar question coming from, from a colleague. And then I'm going to turn to Sub-Saharan Africa. We have a, a question from Daily Monitor in Uganda uh, who asks, uh, how serious is climate change affecting the global economy? Climate change is affecting every country or region in the world. In what ways is affecting especially uh, African countries? And what is your outlook for Sub-Saharan Africa? So first we will go to Egypt, then the outlook for Sub-Saharan Africa, and then we can finish with the climate. And we're done. <laughs> okay. Pitya, can I turn to you for yes, Egypt? Yes, I'll, I'll uh, answer the question on Egypt. So the uh, Egyptian economy is slowing. Uh, we've had uh, growth rates of the order of 6.7 last year in 2022. We're projecting this year's growth to be 3.7 and then going up to 4.1 in 2024. Our forecast for this year is actually unchanged relative to where it was uh, in April. Now, this lower growth in 2024 is mostly because of the um, lack of FX flexibility and the shortages that have developed um, in the FX market in Egypt, which is making it difficult uh, for um, imports to happen. It also have um, dampened in, uh, investor confidence. When it comes to inflation, uh, I think we have seen a relatively high inflation rates. We are projecting inflation at 24.4% percent this year, rising to a 32 uh, in 2024. And a big part of that is because of the depreciation of the currency. And uh, all of this is underpinning the, our advice to, to have policies which restore the macroeconomic balances and also get uh, inflation under control. And perhaps the most important thing is to allow more flexibility in the FX market. I'll stop here. Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, so on, uh, let me just uh, say a, a word on, uh, on, on Sub-Saharan Africa, and then uh, I'll ask Tanya also to, to chime in. Uh, so we have, for the, for the whole region, we have growth that is uh, uh, slowing uh, a bit from 2022 to 2023, from 3.9 to 3.5%. Uh, 
uh, that's a, a very mild downward revision for 2023, about 0 0.1 percentage points. So this is a growth number that is kind of on the low side. I mean, I was talking about earlier about the fact that this is not an environment of very strong and robust growth, and this is certainly one of the regions where we we see that. It's very different from uh, from emerging Asia, for instance. Um, the the uh, um, question was also about the impact of climate change. I mean, it's certainly the case that we're seeing more extreme climate events, and, and some of these can have uh, a strong macroeconomic consequences. We've seen, we've talked about the, the drought in Argentina, we can think about the floods in Pakistan, we can think about the impact of temperatures rising on agricultural yields in general and uh, 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 and agricultural production. So this is certainly something that is, uh, that is very important, especially for countries that have very little fiscal space, very small buffers with which they can address some of that volatility in uh, in, in uh, in, in uh, uh, food prices, and and that's causing in many of uh, many of these countries uh, situations of food insecurity that were particularly acute last year. They are a little bit less acute now because food prices have been coming down, but that remains an important risk going forward. And and and, and climate change is certainly something that is aggravating uh, that that phenomenon. Um, Daniel, anything on Uganda or? Uh, uh, no, this is this is um, one of those countries where we don't have a, a new um, uh, forecast this time, and uh, I think you summarized it very well. Okay, so thank you, Pioli Veye, Petia, and uh, Daniel for your time. Also to all of you for attending uh, this uh, press briefing. On behalf of the Research Department and the Communications Department here at the IMF, I want uh, to remind you that uh, our annual meetings in October will take place in Marrakesh this year. And we hope uh, to see all of you there uh, for where we will launch also a full edition of the World Economic Outlook. Also, if you have any questions, comments, please uh, feel free to send them my way at the media at imf.org. Please enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>